So um, this is our last webinar of our graduate student committee series for SPICI. So if anyone's been with us before, um, this is part of this overarching theme of societal psychosis and really looking at systems that make it difficult to determine and connect with reality. So we had um, our first one on the criminal justice system and then the next one really on racial justice and coalition building. And so we're gonna be building on that today as well as looking a little bit at immigration and added in a little education based on someone's interests, hopefully they're here, um, who indicated as well. So it's really looking at now taking all these ideas together. We've discussed these social issues, but then what can we do? So this is this action step. And um, I'm the GSC policy and applied member at large this year for SPICI. And I really wanted to make policy work for graduate students or anyone else joining us today, something that seems like something they can engage in. And we think about all these social issues, you might be studying them, you might be working in the field, but then how can you engage in this policy work? So that's what we're gonna be doing today with really this tangible product at the end. And the goal um, when you're thinking about this webinar is when you're in your breakout room, you had a preference, maybe it will change a little, you were matched based on your preferences, but what kind of policy work do you wanna create? How can you submit it? who's your audience. I want you to be thinking about that as we go. And it's going to be really supportive. So myself and other people from the GSC and SPICI members, we will be in the main room. So you can call us into your room, um, especially if you want to know would it be a good fit for the newsletter when you're submitting it, um, ideas just based on policy work. So we want this to be a really supportive and interactive webinar. So again, also if you have questions, Sarah can be monitoring and she can interrupt me, but you could raise your hand. I probably won't see since I'm sharing my screen, but Sarah can let me know and feel free to ask any questions that you might have as we go. So really today's agenda here, just going to give an overarching discussion on policy work and kind of how you can get engaged in this area. I know people when they signed up mentioned some other interests they had in this area as well. So I'll briefly do that. Then really delving into how to create policy documents. I'm going to be highlighting only four. There's other ones as well, but really going through policy brief, a resolution, fact sheet, and infographic. And these are all very different in a lot of ways. There's some similarities. So really looking at how you can do this and what's your audience for these, because they will have different audiences. And then we're going to actually spend a majority of today in these breakout rooms. So after this presentation, I'm going to let, we're going to close out and then send you to your breakout rooms to give you the opportunity to do what your group feels is best. So if your group just wants to briefly meet, introduce yourselves, and then kind of just set up a game plan for moving forward, or do you want to get a lot done today? There's different options depending on your group. So we'll have them opened until 830. So you can really base it on that based on what your group wants to do. And again, we will be here to pop in and out. And if you want to bounce off ideas on topics or how to create your document, that's possible for you today as well. So it's a little different than our usual SISI webinars and GSC webinars in this interactive way. So first, just giving a broad overview of why this is important before we engage this today. So really, it's an opportunity to apply the work you're already doing and the knowledge you have to have an influence. So, so many people are already doing such great work, um, whether that be research, clinical, just applied work, whatever real, any work you're doing. And you're typically very passionate about it, whatever it is, this area. And if you're a SISI member, really passionate about social issues. And it's this next step of how can you then make a change? So you're doing this work and you presumably want to have an impact with it. And this is why policy work is really important because it gives you an opportunity to actually have an influence with this work you're doing. It also gives you a chance to have an evidence-based impact, which is really important. So you'll hear a lot of different voices and a lot of different conversations, but you as researchers or people in the field um, and people who are trained really in understanding research and conducting research can weigh the evidence when you're creating these policy documents and you're not just saying a position you're backing it in research you're supporting what you're saying and doing this and it is very different than academic writing so that's also important to think about when you're doing this you do want to be persuasive but still backing it in evidence in a way so that makes sense you want to be having a position it's not supposed to be completely neutral but you are backing it in this actual research 
And it's also important just because legislation and funding, it allows for really a larger scale impact on social issues. And larger scale can also still be at the local level, but a larger scale local impact, a federal impact, depending on where you're doing this. So you can really have your work have a much larger reach and reach a lot of people, um, depending on what the issue is. But no matter what, you can be really like scaling up what you're doing and hopefully help a lot more people in this social issue you are trying to tackle, no matter what it is. So how can you engage in policy work? I did just want to give an overview because we have people coming in at different levels here um, in this work of just different ways you can get involved. And then we'll really get into this last one that we'll be focusing on today. So there's different things like Capitol Hill days and advocacy summits where you can really learn to engage on this on the Hill, for example. And you can meet with um, congressional aides and actually focus on really specific bills. Um, you can attend training specifically on how to advocate for a certain issue or how to engage in this work. And it's kind of like what you're doing right now. And you can also use social media. There's more and more emphasis on this. You can use social media to connect with um, legislative aides, with Congress people, just many people, or just to get information out there. You can really be utilizing this in different ways. And you can target public opinion in that way. And one way to do this is publishing and presenting on policy issues. So of course, you can do this in academic settings, but you can also publish things like op-eds. I know someone mentioned that when they signed up as well as an area they're interested in. So these are different ways and always thinking about that audience. Who are you targeting? If you're targeting a very academic audience, it's going to be different than if you're trying to do an op-ed. And what are you trying to do with the policy work you're doing? And always keeping that in the back of mind, what is this ultimate goal? Engaging with grassroots organizations um, and just collaborating in general, like you're likely not the first person tackling an issue and that's always important to keep in mind. So making sure to be connecting with the people doing this work, especially those on the ground for an issue because they can really support your work and you can support their work and it can be really important collaborations there. You can respond to different calls for comments. It's something I have found really useful. I've been involved in um, comments on different legislation throughout this past year. That's been really great to see it come back to me for more feedback. And it's really a back and forth conversation and has been a really valuable experience, especially for grad students where you might not know where to start with this work, but as the more organizations you're involved in, including SPISI, you can have opportunities for this. Joining a network. So I have at the end of the slides, but for example, one is the research to policy collaborative, there's different networks where you respond to calls um, for different research, like you're using your research to respond to a policy request. So there's different networks that exist like that you can really engage in. You can just contact your reps, you can by phone, by email, and that can be a way to engage, or you can try to set up these meetings. They will meet with constituents, and that's really important too. You can look for policy internships and jobs, as well as BISI has one with the UN, which is really great. And then writing policy documents, which is what we're going to be doing here today. So but honing in on this idea of producing a policy document, again, we're going to be focusing on four specific types of documents today. So this will first, we'll be going over a policy brief, resolution, fact sheet, and infographic. And so I believe Sarah has put the link um, but if anyone doesn't have it, you can just message her also, but if you join Glee, and I'm not sure, but the link is there for box, and there will be examples as we go that you can use. Um, so some of these, I'll explain what each example is, but they're ones I've worked on as well. So what is a policy brief? So for an overview of this. So this should be a short and to the point document. So you're going to want this to be about one to two pages. You'll see the one in box is two pages and it was created by Evan McCracken on this call. So thank you so much for that, Evan. Um, and this policy brief is going to really focus on one topic. And you want to pick an issue that is specific enough that you can really hone in on it. And, but again, not going into the nitty gritty of detail. So that can be the hard balance here of, you want it to, you don't want it to be, for example, one of the topics today is immigration. You can't just tackle all of immigration in a policy brief. So you need to pick a specific issue within the immigration 
that you want to be focused on. So right now, for example, you might want to pick DACA because there's a lot going on around that. If, and then you want to hone in even more there because that is still very broad. Um, and you maybe want to focus in on DACA and college students, for example, or something like that. And you're going to hone in on this one topic and you want to make sure you really focus on that so that the policy brief can actually brief people on an issue and not just be so broad. But also, again, it needs to be simple enough that you're not, it's not a white paper and really full fleshed out report. And that's really important. So the, these key parts here that you're going to be focusing on, it should be describing the importance of the issue. That's the first part. And then just major findings. So you're gonna summarize research here, and then you wanna give actual policy recommendations. So what is this purpose of a policy brief? We know what it is now, but I really wanna use it to reach and influence policymakers. So again, you don't wanna think about this as the end all be all of the situation if you're engaging with policymakers. It's to brief them on an issue and if they want further information on it, they can engage with you later and you can give more information later. So you don't have to think about this as the end, but you want it to be something that makes them think, hmm, this might be an issue I wanna deal with. Like you wanna, get their interest, give them enough information so they understand it. Again, it's kind of what it says, like you're briefing them on this issue and the policy and the recommendations you want to have. Really the key components you'll want to see. And again, this is flexible on exactly how you want to have your brief layout and you can find different examples online as well. You have Evans on racial triangulation in the box so that you can use as an example. But here you want, of course, your title. You really need to introduce the issue. And then you wanna highlight the main points. And again, it can be helpful sometimes also if you like bold these things that you want to stand out. You wanna give an overall context for your approach. So has it been used before? Is it based in some background? Where is this coming from? Where is, what is the overall overarching context? And then you wanna describe the approaches that have been used and the findings. And this should lead to kind of a conclusion. And then you want to end with your policy recommendations. That's really important that, because that's what they're gonna actually be trying to implement. The rest, like we don't know they're gonna read it all, right? So like a lot of people might just jump to these recommendations. So you want that to be very, very clear in your brief that that's a separate part. And you'll see that in evidence example as well. And then you can include references where applicable. References are not necessarily the same in policy documents as they are in academic documents. You don't need to include every citation like ever <laughs> as much. And you just wanna be making sure that people know it's backed in research and cite things where appropriate like statistics and things like that. But you, it's not making sure that you have a full literature review like in academic writing, but it's really honing in on the points um, that are important. But again, you don't wanna be leaving things out either and like biasing anything. This still should be evidence-based. And again, I just wanna draw your attention so this is the example you can use in box, especially if you're going to be working on a policy brief in your breakout room. And then here are some main tips for a policy brief. So first you need to really determine your audience. That's really important. Are, are you briefing an aid? Are you briefing an organization that you want them to take some action? Who is this really aimed for? And I want you to think about that in your groups as well, because of course you have the opportunity to publish with us, but we can also provide support if you want to take that elsewhere after you publish with us. So what is your aim with that and how do you want to use it if you do want to use it? You want you make sure you emphasize why the issue is important. There really needs to be that why, not just, oh, this is the background and you and then this is what we want to happen. But why does that really matter? Making sure, again, you're sticking to one issue. You need to keep it short and simple. And that's really, really important. And there needs to be a logical flow. It all has to basically think about this as like a story arc. You want to be telling a story because that can be really persuasive. And they say that a lot in advocacy trainings in general, that people, especially people in general, but in government, they really respond to these stories. So you want that to be part of it. You want it to be research-based, but you want to be telling a story and make it logically flow. 
Use bullet points, especially for policy recommendations. You want it to be very clear, cut each separate one when you're doing this. Um, be concrete in your policy recommendations. Make it clear what is the ask. And that will be a lot of times if you've ever been on a Capitol Hill day or had these meetings um, with Congress or Senate before, they'll be like, okay, but what's the ask? That's really, really important here. And you want to do the same in your policy briefs and keep it exciting. That's a general recommendation. But again, you're trying to draw this initial interest into the issue and the policy recommendations that you are suggesting. So you want to keep it exciting and people engaged so they will engage with it. Okay. So now I'm going to be moving on to resolutions. Before I start, does anyone have any questions about policy briefs? Yeah, I wondered um, to what degree do you feel like they need to be, um, I think some feedback that I've gotten in the past is like that they need to sound neutral and sort of approachable if someone's like really feeling very strongly on an issue and it's in the opposite direction to the way that the policy is headed. To what degree do you feel like it's important to be sort of like quote unquote neutral or try to include folks like that are feeling really strongly? Yeah. I think that's a really important question. So again, I think this also has to do with your audience and how you expect them to respond. And people will say this about Capitol Hill days as well. You know kind of which offices are gonna go with what you're saying, which ones aren't. And you need to kind of change your language based on that. So I think if you're targeting an audience you think will largely agree with your premise and you're just trying to create recommendations for them, I think you might not have to be as neutral. Again, you can't be totally neutral because you're trying to recommend something and take a stance. So that's why it's a little different than purely academic writing, but you will have to acknowledge other sides if you're targeting this brief to an office that you think is totally against your position. So I think that's really important and hopefully that answered your question, but feel free to let me know if you have any follow-up to that. Thank you. Does awesome. anyone else have any questions? Um, I have a question if that's okay. <laughs> of course. Um, about how, how widely circulated are policy briefs, or actually I suppose this applies to any of the documents we're gonna talk about today. Because if you have a singular audience in mind, that how likely is it that it would get to other audiences from that point. Yeah, no, I think that totally makes sense. So a lot of this, and that's what we're gonna kind of talk about at the end, but that's a great question, is the dissemination a lot of the times also falls on you. So it's again, just like research articles too, if you want things to get somewhere, it has to do with how you disseminate them, but also the organizations you connect to. So that's why it can be really helpful to connect with a larger body because then it actually can get disseminated much more widely if you're connected with the structure, which is actually gonna to relate to this next piece of resolutions really well of being part of a larger organization. On a more individual level, like it could just go to one office if that's all you send it to. And, but if it somehow gets picked up, then it, like certain ones do get picked up and then it might make it further. Also, as we go on, I would say like, for example, infographics, they're much more, you can much more easily disseminate them widely because they're for a more general audience. And you're more likely to have just the general public engage with an infographic than wanting to read a policy brief, for example. So I think that can really depend on, again, that's why it's what is your audience because it's gonna be how you tailor it. And is it readable um, for a general audience? And also thinking about who you're targeting in government too, while they are, experts in the policy side of what they're doing, they're not experts in every single issue and they can't be. So you have to write it for that too and make sure you can get lost in that too and making sure it's very readable to that. Hopefully that answered that as well. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Anyone have any follow-up to that or any other questions? And then Sarah, I don't know if there's anything in the chat that came in. I'm trying. Yeah, I just um, added a response. Someone asked a great question about uh, brief length. And I completely agree. One to two pages. I recommend one page. People will not read. Policymakers will not read more than one page. <laughs> That's really true. Yeah, it's like max two pages. Um, one page is really ideal. Okay. 
Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute. If not, I'll keep going, but stop me at any time. Um, so for this next thing, for a resolution, this is a formal statement of a board on an issue. So I want to just give the caveat for our purposes here. If you wanted to work on a resolution, I wanted to present this because this is a really interesting opportunity and can get disseminated more widely. But for our purposes, unless you are affiliated with an organization, you can write this in your group as more of a position statement, unless you have some board you can take it to. Um, so I wanted to give that caveat here. If you want to work on a resolution, you can work on the overall structure for it and we can publish it more as a position statement of your group of like just individuals we can write as individuals rather than a group and but if you are all part of an organization there's the opportunity to bring your work and have it as a resolution if this is feasible for you and then a board would vote on it and pass it and kind of adopt this idea and so these can be really valuable because they can be disseminated more widely and they're kind of in like the permanent infrastructure of an organization and it's also important to think about when you're writing these statements of the titles you use when you're doing it because you want to make sure you're never speaking on behalf of an organization. I know people are always careful about this in general, but it's really important in policy work here too. So when you're doing this, again, if we write a position statement and we publish it, we'll put it as the position of your group of individuals rather than that anyone's adopting it. But if you have an organization and you're working on a resolution, you can bring it to them. So I wanted to um, say that and give people an idea of something else they can do and collaborate with their organizations on that they're involved in because I've had really valuable experiences writing resolutions over the past year and they've been really great and helpful to think about and like bring it to the board and collaborate. So when you're engaging with a resolution, the purpose of this first, it should align with the organization's mission or the overall values of your group as individuals. And it make that kind of should be the central thing of when you're trying to address a new issue, making sure it's always aligning. And you want to state the organization's position on an issue, and you're going to adopt it in some formal way. So again, the board will vote on it for it to be passed as a resolution. And organizations' positions can really have a strong influence on policymakers. And that's why this is really important and goes back to the question before about dissemination. If an organization overall is a pretty influential, and you can think about these larger bodies of even SPISI does a lot of policy work, APA does a lot of policy work. There's a lot of different things you can think about here of when an organization takes a position, this can have a large impact when they're constantly engaged with policymakers and people are going to them for information. So key components you wanna see here, you wanna make sure you're stating the organization's mission or again, if you're just working as a group, your group's values and goals of what the tier of just more generally, it doesn't have to be related to the specific issue for your first part. You want to set the stage for that. Um, and but it should relate to how it's going to flow. Then an overview of the issue. You want to summarize the main points of the issue, state what the organization and group supports related to that issue, and then give immediate recommendations of how people can act. Again, be concrete about this because that's really important. Concrete, but of course it doesn't have to be so specific that like if they wanted to change something a little that it couldn't be implemented, but still very clear on what you want to happen. Then again, summarize the issue and position, and then you can provide additional resources and references. So in the box, again, I have two justice system examples of actual resolutions that have been passed. Um, one I wrote, I was the main author on, and one I collaborated on, they were both for the Global Alliance for Behavioral Health and Social Justice. Well, those are um, examples and so if anyone has questions about those as I go, I can really give you step by step on my own process in working with those as well. But those directly relate to individuals who are incarcerated. And so tips overall when it comes to resolutions, um, discuss with the governing body throughout the process because you don't want to just be working on some resolution and not have that collaboration because they need to be the ones who are really going to pass it in the end. You want to incorporate suggestions, but still take on ownership as the authors of the document. Again, if you are the one writing about the issue, it's likely that it's in your area and something you're passionate about. And the board is really broad in their interests. So again, you have to take ownership of, okay, I know this area and it can be a back and forth conversation. If they suggest something, it doesn't mean just because they're the board who have to take every single suggestion, but you should consider it 
and see how you can incorporate it. Make sure again, it has a really logical flow in this like story arc and always check back to the mission and purpose and make sure that what you're writing is aligning to that and your goals here. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about that before I move forward? Okay, great. I'll keep going. And if anyone ends up with questions, just let me know. So these, I think, are a little more familiar to people, so they shouldn't take as long. And this is just a fact sheet. So this really should be a single page now, intended to provide essential information about a topic. So purpose of a fact sheet. So first, you need to think about if you are aiming this for general audience or policymakers, there can be different reasons for both. Um, some people might just want to get main facts out to the general public and a fact sheet can make it pretty easy to read, or they might want to have talking points for policymakers and make that into a fact sheet. So those are different ways. And the main point here is that you want key points in a clear way, really key, key takeaway points. You want to summarize the issue in research. And by summarize here, I mean really summarize it, really brief, just take home points provide main concrete talking points of the issue. And if you want, you can incorporate a graphic here. So those are some of the things you can have. So you're just giving the basic overall facts. Again, what is this issue? What's said about it? And what are some talking points? Like, what are some programs that work? So to own example, this is another, this is a fact sheet I worked on for the research and policy collaborative. And then actually, so this fact sheet talking about dissemination actually led to then meetings um, with Congress to work on this issue. So it was really helpful in working with an organization that it was disseminated. But in doing this work, it's really just really basic points of the issue, basic programs that have been shown to work. And then when we talked with them, we talked about how funding these kind of programs would be beneficial. So again, you want just really, really key take home points in this one. And there are these examples in box, again, are just examples. You can format these in different ways and all different things you want to do. Some tips, it can be helpful to just use bullet points or kind of that bullet format, right in a way that allows for talking points where it could just be, you can look at it yourself, even if you were in a meeting with a legislative aide, for example, and you could just look at it and be like, okay, these are my talking points. And then you could elaborate on them, but you don't want the information that you would elaborate on to be on the fact sheet. And then you really need to focus on condensing information. It should be very, very short. Um, does anyone have any questions about fact sheets or what you would want there? Okay, wonderful. And so for our last one for today, an infographic, and I assume this is what people are most familiar with. So these are visual displays with minimal text that provide an overview of a topic. And if you do decide to go this route, there's different ways you can do this. Again, you could create one in PowerPoint if you have access to Canva. It can be really great to create infographics through Canva. You can use Adobe Professional and or any other publishing software that you'd like to use for this. But the purpose here typically will be for a more general audience. So this again, as I have at the end here, can be used on social media. You could post it on a website. Um, if you're in a community organization, for example, you could even print them and put them on the wall, just different things. But infographics can be used in a lot of different ways and they're much easier for more general audience who's not gonna wanna read a whole thing. And typically most people don't wanna read a whole thing um, in a lot of spaces because they're doing so many other things. So this is one use of an infographic. Another one is just part of a larger presentation. So even if you're giving an academic presentation and you have slides, you can incorporate infographics and different things to really help in on a policy. Key components, you want titles and subheadings, visuals, graphs, charts, limited words. Um, here is the main point to just drive home when you're creating this. You just want key statistics and facts. It's just really like these key little tiny points that you just want to see. And just thinking about your color scheme is another important thing to think about. Just visually, again, who are you targeting? Even think about I do work with kids, so I'm going to just say this, but if I was making an infographic for kids, definitely would want it to be super bright, super fun, and just think about your target audience here as well, even when picking colors. And so this, these are two examples. Again, I didn't make these. So one is from the National Immigration Forum and one is from the Global Compact for Migration. So you can even see how different these are. One's a little busier, one has less, 
what and you can have your own personal opinion on what you like and one gives a little more information one gives a little less and then again you kind of have your sources at the bottom but you want to make sure your sources are not the main thing that your eye gets drawn to when you're doing that so some tips here, you want to balance simplicity and complexity. So this can be really difficult with infographics. You want to make sure you're giving people enough information where you're not just like stating the obvious in a way, really. Um, and it can be just something that will benefit someone, but you also need to keep it really simple because it is an infographic. Just make sure you're using credible sources. Of course, I know everyone knows that, but it can be really important in infographics that you make sure you include your source because sometimes they'll just see an infographic with numbers and you're like, where did these numbers come from? Where did this percent come from? So you want to make sure people know where that's coming from. And this one is also important. So do not mislead or omit important data. And this can be really hard and I, not even intentionally, but when you only have like two things and you can't provide context on an infographic, you just want to like kind of take a step back. And even if you know the whole area and you don't feel like you're misleading, if people were to read those statistics without any other background in this area, would they possibly be misled? And that's what I want you to think about um, when creating an infographic. You wanna make sure again, it still has a clear presentation and flow. So even though it's really short, just make sure visually it has a clear presentation, but also just like it's logical, not just random statistics, but they make sense together. And there's still some type of story and reason for everything you have on there. Again, informed by your target audience. Are you targeting people who already know this area? Someone who's never been introduced to this area before? And then you want it to be visually appealing when you're creating it. Now, I just wanna highlight, oh, does anyone have any questions about that before I go on? Okay, great. So some other policy documents. So. These are ones we won't be going over today, but just to give you some ideas, if you're interested in getting more engaged in policy work of what you could get involved in, um, an op-ed or press release, you could again write a position statement, which went along with that resolution idea, a coalition letter, which is um, you have a coalition of people and you can write a letter to someone um, for a specific issue and what you want to happen. And then a white paper, which is more of a report and more in depth and more people may have heard. Now this is responding to someone specifically um, when they signed up what they're interested in, but just wanted to highlight policy related internships and jobs. Again, anyone who's interested in the graduate internship with the United Nations NGO team, um, that the applications come out every year. So if anyone's interested, that's something you look into. And just things to search, thinking about policy, advocacy, government, grassroots, but also looking at the local and federal level. And you can also search for specific issues of interest to you. So not just thinking about policy as a whole, like what kind of policy do you want to engage in? And that's part of why we did this match process today to get you thinking about what areas you're interested in. Here are further resources. All of this is in the box as well, so you can use all this, but these are different things to engage in. And you can see this has a lot of great resources on their site as well, which is really awesome. Okay, so now I know I took questions along the way, but does anyone have any questions? Now, as we wrap up, and then I'm going to tell you next steps now for creating your document, if there's no questions. Okay. And you can always pop back in the main room if you have questions as you go. So what's next? So again, I just want to make sure, focus on your audience. Who do you want this to be disseminated to? And just make sure your work is being tailored to your intended audience. So one audience you know it's going to be is grad students in SISI if you're planning on publishing with us. So that would be one intended audience, but where do you want it to go after that? And then um, what's going to happen? So submitting your work. So you can look out for an upcoming email uh, for a call for this, but you can also just submit directly to me as well. And you can submit it along the way if you'd like feedback on your work from both me and the rest of the graduate student committee, we can all if you send it to me, we can all provide feedback on your work before officially submitting. Also, if you'd like tips or connections for dissemination of your work as you go, either after you publish with us or you decide not to publish with us, um, we can support you in that as well. Okay, so thank you everyone so much. So, um, oh yes, the PowerPoint will be added to box, but um, hopefully that's helpful. So.